anybody can ask, you know, of themselves or yeah. or anyone else. What do you think, Jay? Like that. Yeah, thank you. It's it's actually really nice to be here. Um, my story is a bit different. I'm, I grew up in Australia. Uh, I live in Sweden now, but I, I was heavily um, involved with psychedelics in the 1990s. And I, I took a lot of LSD, uh, mushrooms. But I mean, to start with, it was a it was pleasure. It was fun. and But then it became something. I, I focused on things and I started using it almost as a, like a technique. Um, exploring thoughts and unpacking myself. I got this sensation of being able to look back at myself and to deal with childhood memories and things like I didn't have a particularly bad childhood, but it was a somewhat unusual one. And um, there was some neglect, I think, there, emotional neglect. But all these things came up through this experience. And then I, after that, I became more, I got a stronger sense of connection with people and, and other things too. I think it's like you sort of, the self dies down and you become something larger. And then I haven't taken psychedelics for 20 years. But in that time, I've continued with the, a lot of the memories and ideas and feelings that I had. And I'm using other things, I think, to access. Um, I, I play didgeridoo, which is sort of strange yeah. if you're Australian. <laughs> people, people laugh. The breathing exercises that are part of that is something that I find is actually very psychedelic. Mm -hmm. And now I'm also interested, I've been in India, I'm, I'm interested in yoga and, and mental sort of focus and mental concentration. That's my story. But what I'm really interested in and sort of been touched on a few times is how can, how can these ideas and concepts become more institutionalized? How can we apply them to structures and how can people take their own experiences out of everybody has a profound experience, but how does it become part of social practice without like religion or or these other sort of tried structures being dependent on? Well, I think in part uh, the uh, you know I don't want to necessarily blow my own horn here, but I think that's the notion behind the McKenna Academy. In the yeah, sense I so. that I, it's a place for learning, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's virtual or eventually a physical place or both. It's a place where people can come together and share ideas and learn from each other, learn from nature, learn from the psychedelics. Uh, it's the, I want it to be the first psychedelic academy, you know, that's existed in 1500 years since mm -hmm. Eleusis. It, it basically, in my conception, its historical roots go back to Eleusis. And Eleusis was a psychedelic university, and that's what the, what the academy is to be, a, a place for learning uh, where not necessarily all the teachers are human. You know, we, we sort of welcome the plant teachers to the table and try to respect the wisdom that they have, however they may choose to deliver it. So that's part of the dynamic. And, uh, you know, the the academy, uh, I think, a, you know, an academy like this or any kind of institution like this, it risks becoming a cult or it risks becoming a place where you go and people tell you what you're supposed to think you know, and how you're supposed to think. We're the opposite of that. We're, mm -hmm. the whole mission of the academy is to teach people, to encourage people to think for themselves, you know, to, to, to apprehend the world as they see it and not be ashamed of that, you know, uh, express that to other people. If you're wrong, you'll be told, you know, I mean, there'll be plenty of people that push back, but the idea is, you know, one of the things that, that one of the limitations of institutional science that we were talking about in the conversation is there are just certain things you can't say in institutional mm -hmm. science if you want to be taken seriously, if you want to be a successful scientist. And the academy is, is again, it's a place where ideas are encouraged. People are encouraged to examine them, not that we necessarily 
you know, I mean, some are more valid than others, but, but I think people should be encouraged to think, you know, use their God-given ability to think. And, uh, and the plant teachers can be, uh, can be cognitive tools, essentially. They can help you to learn how to use your mind in an, op in an optimum way. So that's, that's very much part of its mission. It's, it's your, vision. your words give me a lot of hope. You know? It's very hopeful what you say. Well, thank you. Thank you. They have for a long time. I'm interested in the culture of psychedelics too. What happens after the act and how people make sense of it and share it and things like that. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's the question. That, that's really the, the core of the thing. So you have the psychedelic experience, then what do you do with that? You know, you have to integrate it and somehow put the influence of that into the world. And it may just be that you make some changes in yourself or, you know, you have creative ideas or whatever. But the idea is to empower people to, again, just uh, learn how to use their minds. Mm -hmm. And and that's, that's really what it is. What it's about. At some yeah. stage, people have to take it back into themselves. The party scene that I was involved in the 90s, I was in rave culture in India and Europe and North Africa, and that was great, but, but you can only do so much in that setting. You had to come back to yourself and, and be quiet and think and introspective, and it wasn't, it wasn't loud, it wasn't external. It was something that you dealt with in yourself, I think. Yes. And I, Fortunate that I got to that point. Some people I know didn't. We spoke. Um, they spoke before about the psychosis that emerges also, which is popular. It's, po it's possible, but it's it's not necessary. I think. I think people can avoid it too. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I really appreciate what you're saying around you know utilizing these substances as a, as a catalyst for change, and how do we give back to the the community and the medicine for the change that has been. That we've experienced and transformation we've had we really have an opportunity right now to contribute to psychedelics mm -hmm. to the culture you know before the government comes in and tells us what we have to do uh, so we're kind of at this nexus point for education and cultural change and we have an impact we're mm -hmm. seeing that now even just today we're having an impact i think that came up last week i've been watching every one of these for the last four weeks <laughs> and last week right. people were talking that legalization and the, the 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 culture that comes with legalization that it can become corporate that it can become a state apparatus and things like that whereas the underground culture perhaps is more authentic and more diverse than even though people are dealing with the paranoia and threat of, of the law there's also a diversity there right and the bottom line is not about money it's about community and impact you know and, and mm -hmm. beyond the corporatization of psychedelics keeping it flowing within the community rather than no. just putting a dollar sign on it and commodifying no, no, exactly. Exactly. Dennis, what are your thoughts on commodification of psychedelics? Well, uh, I, I don't, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm still in the process of forming my opinions. I think, I think that, you know, I, I'm happy to see the research go forward. I'm happy to see the development of psychedelics and, and integration into mainstream medicine, if, if that's happening. But I think it can't happen without transforming mainstream medicine. So I don't think you can, I, I think something that's being lost as psychedelics are uh, identified uh, simply as solutions to mental illness. I mean, they, they are that, but they're much more than that. As I've often been fond of saying, these things are medicines for the soul. Yeah. And you, the medicines for the individual soul, for sure, but the collective soul, the species soul, even the soul of the planet, these things speak to us on all levels. And you can't just reduce them to crystals and capsules, you know. I mean, I mean, you lose a lot. Of course, the, you know, the approach to developing these things as therapeutics requires that you do that.
but it's important to remember those roots. It's important to remember, you know, what, you know, that, that they can't be used in isolation this way, you know, and that's why I don't think that we should forget the plant medicines, you know, even though we may have, we may be able to go to a clinic and pay lots of money to have a clinical uh, session with psilocybin. And that's great for people that need that. And that's in, hopefully they can afford it. This is another thing. I don't see psychedelic therapies getting integrated into medicine until something is done about well, the cost of this. Most of us are outside that framework and most of us relates to psychedelics through plant medicines. We either take mushrooms, we take ayahuasca, that sort of thing. It's important not to lose that because that gives us our connection to nature. And one of the main sort of realizations or revelations that people get from psychedelics, which I think is very important, is the revelation that we're out of sync with nature, we're out of kilter, and psychedelics gives us the tool to step out of our reference frame for temporarily and look at our situation and, and think, hmm, what's wrong with this picture? And how can we bring ourselves back into harmony with nature? And I think that's why I think that's why I call psychedelics their Gaian messengers, Gaian ambassadors, because I do believe in Gaia as a concept, and these are chemical messengers that Gaia has developed, uh, you know, to send to our species. And the the main message is wake up. You know, wake up, you monkeys, you're wrecking this place. And, you know, rethink about how you're going to relate to nature. So so I don't think you can do that. You know, you can, you can develop these things as pharmaceuticals, and that may be okay. But it's also important to remember there's a wider cultural context. And we have to be, uh, we have to be certain that we preserve the, the, indigenous traditions, the older traditions, and also the medicines themselves, you know, many of which are in danger. Uh, mm. You know, so so that's, I mean, that's we, we, could, we could say much more, but that's kind of my, my thumbnail sketch of it. And I think that's an application for multimedia too, working with indigenous people. Right, right. And that I appreciate, it's not just you know, one route. There's, it's a whole, there's many components to all this. It's, you can't just, you know, put it in a capsule and crystallize it and call it a day and commodify it. There's, you know, there's energy, there's a spirit to these plants. Right, right. And I think that the corporate community, uh, the, uh, you know, investment community and all that, they have a moral obligation to integrate reciprocity into their business plans. They had, they should, make an effort to uh, give something back to the to the indigenous cultures that have been the stewards of this wisdom for so long. Now mm. we're seeing that come together with, uh, you know, with clinical practice with the best of biomedicine. And hopefully we can see a fusion of that into something that is really more than either one of these things. So that's that's what I hope for. I'm pleased at the increasing uh, acceptance of, uh, of psychedelics, but we'll see where it goes. Do you think, Dennis, that set, set and setting are an insurance policy in some ways, that if you were to have the set and setting of the clinical environment, it just wouldn't be the same with the other situation with Indigenous people and nature awareness and ritual and things like that? Well, I, I think that set and setting are very important. You know, they're, they're fundamental elements of the psychedelic experience but whether but we 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 can make you know we can construct our own set and settings that are that are appropriate you know it can be like a traditional shamanic kind of ceremonial situation it can be neo-shamanic it can be psychotherapeutic the i i think that it's important that there be a structure, that there be a set and setting, rather than, you know, take it while you're on the freeway at 70 miles an hour. This is probably not a good idea. <laughs> it should be approached thoughtfully. 
uh, you know, but how you specifically construct the set and setting, there's a great range of what's appropriate, as long as there is a setting. I like to think, message I get sometimes from ayahuasca is, ayahuasca is a liquid. It will fill whatever vessel you create for it, you know, and there can be some that will facilitate the experience and others that maybe not so much. And that's mm. where it comes down to individual judgment, you know? And uh, so, you know, we are, we are in the process of constructing this relationship with our symbiotic partners, because that's what these things are. That's what these plants and, and fungi are, are their partners with us in a symbiosis. We're trying to figure out appropriate ways to make that relationship work in the 21st century, sure. you know, and, and we can learn from indigenous cultures and from the past, but we, we're not in the past, we're, mm -hmm. in, the, we're in the present. So uh, is, is there another 